when we're moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus. The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its cross-government coordination of COVID recovery policies incorporates the outcomes from recent COBRA meetings to discuss the impact of the Omicron variant. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, the recovery from COVID remains a priority as we continue to respond to variants such as Omicron. The First Minister joined four nations' COBRA calls on the 10th and 19th of December to discuss actions across the different governments and the coordination of a cross-UK response to the Omicron variant. These calls included consideration of the latest data, international travel, vaccination programmes, testing and self-isolation, and the impact on public services. Funding to support additional interventions was also discussed. The First Minister confirmed last week that we will publish a revised strategic framework in the next few weeks that seeks to be more sustainable, less restrictive and more proportionate as we continue to live with COVID and manage any future variants. Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you. There has been much speculation that the UK Government is going to unilaterally end the free provision of LFDs. Given our recovery from COVID requires us to keep the virus under control, does the Deputy First Minister agree that decisions on the continued need for LFDs must be made on a four-nation basis and not by the UK Government in isolation? Cabinet Secretary. I think a four-nations approach on this question would be essential. Lateral flow tests uh, form a, a very significant part of our approach in managing the pandemic and also those of the rest of the United Kingdom. And the availability of these free tests has been an, an integral part of the way in which we have managed the pandemic. So I certainly would want to see any question about the, um, the, the future steps that are taken on LSDs to be taken on a four nations basis. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen a divergence in approach to restrictions taken across the uh, four different parts of the United Kingdom, but very little divergence in terms of case rates. Indeed, there have been circumstances in the last few days where the case rates in Scotland have actually been higher than case rates south of the border, where there have been fewer restrictions. Given that we are likely to see more variants of COVID coming uh, in uh, month, the months ahead, how will the Scottish Government reflect on this experience in deciding whether to impose additional restrictions uh, as we go forward? Cabinet Secretary. As Mr Fraser will be aware, we will look at a range of data to inform our judgments about the appropriateness of any restrictions that are applied. And ministers have to be satisfied that those restrictions are proportionate um, in relation to the evidence before us. I would counsel Mr Fraser against um, jumping to the assumptions that underpin his question. Uh, because what also has to be factored in is the fact that uh, variants can affect different parts of the United Kingdom at different times. So, for example, the um, uh, developments in London uh, preceded developments here in Scotland and have no doubt taken their course and completed their course earlier than they are taking their course in Scotland. And fundamentally, the Scottish Government must take the appropriate decisions that we judge to be um, essential to protect public health in Scotland. Question number two, Russell Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government to provide an update on its handling of freedom of information requests against the 20 working day statutory deadline. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and thank the Member for his question. The Scottish Government routinely publishes the FOI performance statistics on a monthly basis. In November 2021, the most recent month for which data is available, we answered 90 per cent of FOI requests within 20 working days. The equivalent figure for 2021, up to and including November, was 85 per cent. Scottish Government response time have, received significantly, have recovered significantly since the initial impact of the coronavirus outbreak in 2020. This has been achieved at the same time we have handled our highest ever volume of requests. Nevertheless, we are not complacent about our performances and remain committed to achieving the 95 per cent target agreed within the, with the Scottish Information Commissioner and to maintaining performances at the level we were doing prior to the coronavirus outbreak. Russell Finlay. This SNP Government has a track record of hostility towards the FOI. What justification is there for making de facto public bodies like Zero Waste Scotland, funded by government and set up to carry out government policy, exempt from FOI? And will the Minister consider widening FOI to bodies such as these? 
Minister. Thank you, President Officer. We have previously used our power under uh, Section 5 of FOISA to extend coverage of the Act to further, to further entities in significant ways. Most of the recently we extended coverage of FOISA to all registered social landlords and their subsidiaries in 2019. The Scottish Government will set out its broad approach soon to the future use of Scottish Minister's powers to extend FOISA. I can confirm that we will consider all areas highlighted in response to our 2019 consultation on the future use of Minister's powers, including the social care sector, transport provider, NFD, PPP, PFI projects and the work of regional hub cause. Jackie Bailey. Aside from the time taken to respond to FOIs, there are issues about the substance of those responses. And whilst I'm sure that the Scottish Government is not deliberately withholding information, um, there is um, questions raised about the quality of the responses, both to FOIs and to written parliamentary questions, that suggest a lack of transparency at the heart of government. Would the Minister therefore review the quality of the responses and take action to improve transparency in government. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and thank the member for the question. Uh, as we've continued, since I came into the post, I've continually reviewed and looked at how we can make these things work better. Obviously, working within the constraints we've had during coronavirus, there have been many challenges there. But I am aware of certain situations, and I have been working towards with officials to make sure we can make things better. Question number three, Annabel Ewing. Apologies, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its policies across government will support people living in the Cowdenbeath constituency to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the COVID recovery strategy sets out how we will recover from the pandemic by working collaboratively with our partners in local government, business, and the third sector. Priorities for recovery will vary by location, and we are committed to working with communities to understand these and tailor services to support them. I recently chaired the first meeting of the COVID Recovery Programme Board with the President of COSLA. Its members include representatives from Scottish Government, local government, business and the third sector. The Cowdenbeath constituency benefits from the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Deal, which aims to deliver inclusive and sustainable economic growth across the region through investment in housing, innovation, transport, skills and culture. Annabel Ewing. I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. And I would say at this point that my sense in terms of COVID recovery uh, is that people in my Cowdenbeath constituency are most focused, in fact, on the need to see the full reinstatement of health and social care services. In that regard, can the Deputy First Minister advise as to what extent the planning for uh, this will be led nationally, since obviously at the present time, local health boards such as NHS Fife must prioritise their resources to deal with the critical COVID winter challenges that they face? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, th th this is a very important issue, and I think the response has got to be a collaborative approach between national and local government. Uh, the Scottish Government has initiated discussions with our local authority partners to satisfy all of us that the necessary steps have been taken to strengthen the delivery of social care services, recognising the critical dependence on these services within local communities. Um, I had a discussion along with the Health Secretary and the Social Justice Secretary last week with the leadership of COSLA. I have a follow-up session later on this evening at which we will be looking at the responses of local resilience partnerships to satisfy ourselves that all steps have been taken to strengthen social care to address the priorities that Ms Ewing highlights on behalf of her constituents in Cowdenbeath. Question number four, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it gives as part of its cross-government COVID-19 strategy reviews long-term strategies to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, through the course of the pandemic, our strategy has changed with factors such as the vaccine take-up and vaccine waning, levels of, adhe of adherence to COVID-19 rules and guidance and new variants. All can combine to produce very different outcomes requiring different responses. In the long term, we must adapt our thinking to how we can manage the virus and become more resilient to it in the future. This will mean seeking ways that are more proportionate, sustainable and less restrictive. The Scottish Government is therefore currently working on and will publish over the next few weeks a revised strategic framework which will set out more fully how that process of adaptation can be managed with a view to building that greater resilience. Brian Whittle. 
Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? But he will be aware that the pandemic has greatly reduced the public's access to physical activity and leisure activities, which have had a significant impact on people's physical and mental health, as well as increasing inequalities. So, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what the Scottish Government will actively do to encourage and help the restart of these activities and leisure activities and ensure that all will have access to these opportunities? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I recognise unreservedly the importance of the point that Mr Whittle makes and that such services and opportunities must be available to all communities. And we are working with our local authority partners as part of the COVID Recovery Programme Board that I referred to in my earlier answer uh, to, uh, to enable uh, such an approach to take place and for these services to be available. I would, however, put in one caveat to that point, uh, and, and, and that is this. That, and the First Minister made reference to this point yesterday. We have to ensure that social care services are available for all of our constituents as an absolute priority. And in my answer to Ms Ewing, I indicated that we were reviewing with local resilience partnerships the effectiveness of that delivery, because I am conscious, because of staff absence through Omicron, that there is intense pressure on the availability of social care services. The implications of prioritising social care may well be that some of the services that Mr Whittle would like to see restarted for absolutely understandable reasons might have to be restarted slightly later to enable us to prioritise so social care. So I think it's important that I'm candid with Parliament about that point, that um, however um, valuable and important the point that Mr Whittle makes, which I unreservedly accept, we have to make sure that we prioritise the, the, the measures that will enable us to deliver social care effectively. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. Cabinet Secretary, I have had numerous constituents in touch about issues through their vaccination status. I know my Labour colleagues and other MSPs across the Chamber have raised this, but boosters are now adding another level of challenge. When will the Scottish Government ensure that boosters show on the app as a booster if someone has received both doses in the EU or another part of the UK? because they are currently showing as dose one or two, which makes travel to some countries impossible, and constituents have not been able to get help from NHS Inform. Cabinet Secretary. The, 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 I, I'm, as I have indicated to Parliament before, in a programme of this scale, where we are talking about in excess of 10 million vaccinations, there are bound to be um, uh, difficulties for some individual cases. What I would say to Sarah Boyack is that the NHS Inform team are uh, working hard to address any of those uh, discrepancies that emerge. If members of Parliament are having difficulty resolving those issues on behalf of constituents, I would be happy to hear from members of Parliament and to make sure they're, they're addressed. I've had a number of representations directly from members of the public, which I've asked to be addressed, and they have been addressed. So I'd be very happy to address any points that members of Parliament wish to draw to my attention. Question number five, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government what considerations it will give in relation to its proposals for the scheduling of government business in the Chamber in order to take account of the various impacts of COVID-19 and Scotland's recovery from it. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Ms Fisher for her question. Responding to the impacts of COVID-19 and managing Scotland's recovery from the pandemic is the central focus of the Scottish Government. And this will be reflected in our approach to scheduling of future government business. The First Minister's weekly statement to Parliament is an example of our commitment to ensuring Parliament is updated on all developments. Beatrice Wishart. I thank the Minister for that answer. 100,000 people are living with long COVID, and for many it has radically altered their lives. Thousands are also self-isolating, ill and relying on others. COVID has significant impacts on those they live with, including children now supporting adults with daily tasks. Will the Scottish Government provide a ministerial statement on, or any update on its support, whether financial, educational or other, for those young carers? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the member for the question. And probably the best bet at this stage would be to say that is probably an issue for your business managers to take up. Well, you do, in your case, that is a bit difficult right enough. Sorry, uh, my, my, uh, but with regards to it might be an idea for me to uh, possibly talk to other business managers and bring up what you have brought forward here today, Ms Swisher, and uh, we could possibly discuss it at the next bureau. And apologies if I have offended you in any shape or form. Thank you. And Stephen Kerr. Very delicate, Minister. Very delicate. Uh, 
Parliamentary portfolio question rotas are available months in advance, and yet we continue to see Scottish ministers answering questions on their brief in portfolio questions virtually from their homes or even from their offices. Does the Minister for Parliamentary Business agree with me that meeting their obligations to appear in this chamber in person allows ministers to show their respect for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people whom we have been elected to serve? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And can I just say, well, the Deputy First Minister and I are here today answering our questions as is uh, the way it should be. But uh, we do live in extremely difficult times and there are situations and there will be times from now and again where some members or ministers may be uh, answering remotely. But as a rule of thumb, we tend to agree, and I think you, I know, the member knows this, presiding officer, from our discussions at Bureau, that we tend to try and ensure that ministers are, at least one of us, are here physically in the chamber at one point. Should there be a problem with any remote communication, then there will be someone else on site, another minister, to make sure the question can be answered. So should someone be remote, there is still the option for us to have an answer physically in the chamber. Question number six, Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the UK Government to discuss the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and what the outcome was. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, there are frequent Four Nations ministers and officials calls focusing on COVID, which take place at every level, um, uh, including the participation of the First Minister. The most recent First Minister call took place on the 19th of December to discuss, to discuss the response to the Omicron variant, and one is due to take place later on today. A separate call for health ministers took place on the 6th of January. We will continue to engage proactively at a Four Nations level to protect as effective as possible the health of the people of Scotland and to recover from the pandemic. Alex Rowley. I thank Mr Swinney for that answer. He will no doubt be aware the impact of the pandemic and the recovery from it covers a wide range of government policy. Uh, while there is much that needs to be tackled, to recover from the pandemic, one of the most pressing things right now is the cost of living and, in particular, the unsustainable rise in energy costs. Has the Deputy First Minister made representations to the UK Government regarding this, and does he agree that reducing the cost of energy will be essential to recover from the cost of living crisis following the impact of the pandemic? Cabinet Secretary. I understand entirely the point that Mr Early puts to me, and Scottish ministers have raised these issues with the United Kingdom Government. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I would imagine, share the concerns that Mr Early has about the impact of rising energy prices on household incomes, coupled to the reductions in, for example, uh, the child uh, payments under um, uh, universal credit. Uh, there has been, um, uh, you know, th th that has further eroded the incomes of households. The Scottish Government has taken measures um, by doubling the child payment to try to remedy some of these, uh, these issues. But I do agree with Mr Rowley about the importance of energy costs, the necessity of addressing them, and uh, these are obviously reserved issues, which is uh, entirely proper. The discussion is with the United Kingdom Government, and I assure them that Scottish Ministers will continue to press these arguments to protect households within Scotland. Question number seven, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what cross-government strategies have been identified as part of its work on COVID-19 recovery to support communities and businesses most affected by the pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the COVID recovery strategy focuses on supporting those most affected during the pandemic and complements a range of sector recovery plans. Our NHS recovery plan, published on the 25th of August 2021, sets out key commitments that will support recovery over the next five years and is backed by over a billion pounds in investment. Our education recovery plan, published on the 5th of October, puts improving educational outcomes at the heart of our learning, of our learning recovery. Um, the plan details the key next steps, including measures to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. The Scottish Government have also worked with um, a, a range of different public authorities around the country to develop regional economic strategies in relation to Mr Kidd's constituency with the Glasgow City region, uh, which was launched in 2020, December 2021. This collaboration has ensured alignment around inclusive growth, increasing productivity and net zero ambitions. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I have been contacted by small local businesses which were allowed to remain open during, throughout the pandemic 
due to being essential, but have nonetheless taken a substantial hit to their income. They did not receive the same kind of funding as forcibly closed businesses during the height of the pandemic. I would be obliged that the Cabinet Secretary could outline what strategies have been discussed by the Scottish and UK governments to strengthen the long-term viability of small to medium-sized local businesses, including those categorised as essential, as we continue to move forward out of the grip of the pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, one of the measures that we have tried to take, which I understand the distinction that Mr Kidd makes in his question between businesses that remained open, but one of the measures that we have taken, which has affected a whole range of different businesses, has been, for example, some of the relief on business rates, which have been present for a number of sectors on a continuous basis, and the Finance Secretary has set out that, that they will continue for part of the next financial year. There is obviously ongoing support that the Government makes available through the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which assists with the cost of running small businesses in all localities in Scotland. And, uh, we have a number of strategies in place uh, around, for example, the support to the retail sector and other developments in, the, uh, in enterprise policy, which are designed to support the very companies that, to which Mr Kidd refers. Question number eight, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government <coughs> excuse me, what preparations it is making for the local government elections in 2022 in order that people can vote safely. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you, Mr Macdonald, for your question. The statutory responsibility for funding delivering local government elections rests with councils and returning officers. The Parliament has already approved a number of legislative measures designed to help returning officers ensure people can vote safely. In addition, the Scottish Government is fin funding the system that will electronically count the votes cast, and my officials are in dialogue with the Commission about the arrangements for delivering safely in the context of the pandemic. The legislation passed by Parliament and the discussions in the electoral with the electoral community have been and continue to be informed by experience of successfully holding last year's Scottish election. Gordon MacDonald. Thank the Minister for that answer. Voters in the Belerno area of my constituency at the last election in May had lengthy queues at polling stations well beyond the 10 pm normal closure time, with the last vote being cast at 11.30 pm. Can the Minister outline what steps will be taken to ensure that people can cast their vote and avoid this situation being repeated at the forthcoming local government elections in May? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The operation of each polling station is a matter for the relevant returning officer. The returning officer in Edinburgh has told me they have reviewed polling provision in light of the experience in May 2021, which was largely a result of adverse weather during the day, which encouraged a large proportion of voters to delay their attendance at the polling place until the evening. All those who were in the queue at 10 pm were able to cast their vote. For this May's election, each returning officer will seek to ensure that voters can vote safely taking into account public health advice and guidance from the Electoral Management Board for Scotland, including directions in relation to the operation of polling places. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I actually thank those across Scotland who did put in a power of work to make sure the Holyrood election was able to go ahead safely, and also acknowledge the work of Graham Day on a cross-party basis to make sure we were able to have that election. I don't think we should undermine the work which actually went in to that election. But can I ask the Minister two key points? Um, will emergency proxy votes still be in place for the uh, council elections in case people do still have to self-isolate? And also, will the Scottish Government look to review the provision of a Royal Mail delivery for each council candidate standing in this election? Minister. Uh, with regards to Mr Day, I always have difficulty uh, giving credit to my former colleague, or current colleague even, uh, but uh, in, this case, in this case, I probably will do. With regards to uh, uh, emergency uh, papers, uh, that, that, that's part of the SSI that's already gone through at this stage, where they'll still be able to do that. With regards to the second part of your question, that would probably be up to local authority areas to decide in their actual area whether they want to do it or not. Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And of course, we would all want to see safe elections. And I would associate myself with the comments just made about the conduct of the 2021 elections. But it's not just about polling day, it's also about the, the run-up to the election and the campaign itself, indeed. And I think we would all want to see uh, candidates being able to meet voters face to face, because we know how important that is, obviously in line with public health regulations. So is it the Minister's expectation that the election will be conducted in a more face to face manner, the campaign? I mean uh, and certainly can he explain to Parliament how decisions will be taken about any further restrictions due to any emerging variants? Minister. 
OK, Mr O'Kane, I will get my crystal ball out right now and try and work out where we are going to be when it comes to the election. But in all honesty, I, I understand where you are coming from. I understand where you are coming from, and, and I know myself, as a candidate last year, how difficult it can be for us all sitting there and not being able to physically go out and do anything about it. Uh, what I can assure the member is, uh, should there be any changes uh, one way or the other, I will make sure I bring it to the Chamber myself to make sure you are aware of what is going with regards to the election and ensure that hopefully we do end up in a place where we have as close to normal election as possible, but I can't make any promises because who knows after the last 20 months. Thank you. There will be a very short pause before we move to the next portfolio. Thank you. The next portfolio uh, questions is Net Zero Energy and Transport. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or enter the letter R in the chat function during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when, whether it will provide an update on when its refreshed energy strategy will be published. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government will publish a draft energy strategy and just transition plan in spring this year. As, as part of its approach to the refreshed energy strategy, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the Scottish Government will consult with a wide range of stakeholders to assess its position on nuclear as part of Scotland's future energy mix? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government's position on nuclear energy has not changed under present technologies and that we do not support the uh, building of any new nuclear power stations in Scotland and therefore it will not feature as part of the wider energy strategy review. Um, and supplementary firstly from uh, Fiona Hislop who is joining us remotely. I hope. Hydrogen technology and its deployment and delivery needs to be a key part of Scotland's energy mix. And other countries are marching ahead on this work for mass production and deployment rather than just pilot projects. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure the Chamber that the energy strategy will see a step change in Scotland's work on hydrogen development, use and deployment as an energy source? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Deputy Brian Officer, uh, Ms Hislop will be aware that on the 10th of November last year we published our draft at Hydrogen Action Plan, which sets out a very strong strategic approach to the development of a hydrogen economy here in Scotland. It is also supported by £100 million of programme investment over the course of the next five years, which is specifically targeted at exhilarating the development of renewable hydrogen uh, at scale here in Scotland. Uh, I can also assure the member that as part of our energy strategy and just transition plan, we will ensure that we develop further support around the hydrogen economy in Scotland and ensure we do so at pace in order to ensure that Scotland is able to maximise the potential that can come from the development of hydrogen technology and its production here in Scotland. And supplementary from Mark Ruskell, who is joining us remotely. Thanks. Can the Cabinet Secretary update the Chamber on how the cost of nuclear energy currently compares with renewables? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, nuclear power is a bad deal for uh, consumers. In 2016, Hinkley Point C nuclear power plant received a contract for different strike price of some £92.50 pence per megawatt hour, uh, which has now increased by some 25 per cent since then. Uh, recent uh, power price spikes underline the need to create better outcomes from energy investments, particularly for those struggling with household finances. Internal analysis has identified that in 2030 alone, Pinkley could add almost £40 a year to a consumer's bill, whereas an equivalent offshore wind farm would reduce bills by some £8 a year. Significant growth uh, in renewables, storage, hydrogen and in carbon capture are, in our view, the best way in which to secure Scotland's future energy needs and to meet our net zero objectives. Question number two, Michelle Thompson, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government in what ways the Internal Market Act of December 2020 could impact on its ability to meet its net zero targets. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is determined to take all actions within our powers to tackle the climate emergency and deliver the legally binding targets set by this Parliament of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. But the Internal Market Act can undermine decisions made by this Parliament, including in wholly devolved climate and environmental policy. The Act means that standards set elsewhere in the UK must be accepted here in Scotland, regardless of our regulations. It is, in my view, an attack on the powers of this Parliament and it poses a direct threat to our ambitions to achieve net zero. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that reply. In today's Economy and Fair Work Committee, it became clear that the Internal Market Act acts as an enabler for a whole raft of other legislation. For example, the subsidy control bill is one area of concern. Professor David Bell of Stirling University in his submission noted that, and I quote, it is also not clear how the bill might interact with policies that are intended to move the economy towards net zero. For example, if the Scottish Government proposed to subsidise industrial plants to reduce their carbon footprint, would it be forced by the Secretary of State for Bays to request a CMA assessment of this action? To what extent does the Cabinet Secretary share the concerns of Professor David Bell? Cabinet Secretary. The concerns which have been raised by uh, Professor Bell are indeed serious, and the Scottish Government has consistently highlighted our own concerns about the reservation of subsidy control in the UK Internal Market Act uh, and what this means for devolved policy making. The Internal Market Act has sweeping implications for a wide range of decisions made by this Parliament. The Act not only reserved state aid, a previously devolved matter, but gives the UK Government uh, powers to decide how public money is spent in wholly devolved policy areas, as well as imposing new market uh, access principles that could force us to accept standards set in other parts of the UK. It is an unprecedented assault on the devolved powers and the responsibilities of this Parliament, which is why the Act should be repealed. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support ferry services in Scotland. Minister Graeme Day. But then obviously the current ferries plan delivered transformational changes with new routes for Gourick to Craig and Camelton, Loch Boy to Maui, a dedicated barra vessel, increased sailings to Mull and Arran. The planned investment of £580 million pounds, it will improve Scotland's ferry infrastructure, the procurement of new Iowa vessels, the purchase of the MV Log Freezer, as work continues as the small vessel replacement programme for new vessels uh, and uh, for Danoon, Kilcreggan, Mull and South Uist, and freighters for Orkney and Shetland uh, moves forward. Um, we also continue, I should say, to explore possible options for second-hand tonnage. 
um, both for passenger and freight purposes. And we are recognising the pressure on local authorities since 2017, we provide an additional £50 million of funding uh, to help them deliver the ferry services that they are responsible for. Rhoda Grant. Communities that rely on the Scottish Government for lifeline ferry services have been failed. The Minister must involve operators, unions and communities in strategic planning to make sure that services meet their needs. Currently, there is no strategic plan, only service cuts and eye-watering delays in building our new, ferry services, new ferries, which is ongoing. Capacity has been cut due to lack of funding and no alternative services are proposed from Harris for six months when the Uig Harbour is upgraded. I could go on daily. The list gets longer. Can I ask how on earth the Minister proposed to deliver lifeline ferry services in the face of now additional budget cuts? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I have uh, acknowledged here in the past that we must improve the delivery of fer uh, ferry services to our island communities. I have never shut from that. In terms of strategic planning, there are a multitude of, of, of options moving forward about how we do that. And one, one in, uh, for example, is one that I have instigated, which is for the role, an enhanced role for the Communities Board, to hear the voice of communities heard through that. We also uh, engage with local authorities. But of course, um, we can and we must do better. But let me pick up on the, the point, which is a reasonable one, about the services to Harris uh, later this year uh, because of the um, closure of Uig Harbour. And interestingly, on that point, Uig Harbour is closing for an upgrade being funded by the Scottish Government, a very substantial upgrade for a harbour that we don't actually own. I think that demonstrates our commitment. Well, I, I see Rhoda Grant shaking her head, but £60 million is a considerable sum of money to be invested in a port which has not been maintained to the standard that we would require. But to, to, to be more constructive on this point, I absolutely recognise the concern of the community, and my officials are working with CalMAT to see how we can mitigate the impact of this necessary work on this community. And there are a number of supplementary requests on this question. I will be able to take some of them, but sadly not all given time constraints. Uh, supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Presiding officer, Minister, CalMAC has admitted that some of its skippers are neither experienced nor content enough to sail to Ardrossan or Gurek, its port of refuge, in moderate, not to mention bad weather, leading to sailings being cancelled needlessly. What discussions has the Minister had with CalMAC regarding the training of its skippers to minimise this problem going forward? Minister. President officer, I should stress at the outset, and I'm sure Kenny Gibson agrees with us, that the decisions around the safety of passage and berthing at various ports must lie rightly with the masters of the vessels uh, concerned, and it would be wrong for anyone to challenge these individual decisions, which are always taken on the basis of safety of passengers, crew and the vessel itself. But uh, I have had officials in dialogue with uh, CalMAC on this matter over the last 40 hours, because it is concerning uh, what has been suggested. And what, what is the Mayor's presiding officer is that all of the crews are fully trained and in normal circumstances, exter experienced masters are familiar with specific routes and they will be deployed in these locations. However, given the very acute circumstances that are in place at the moment, as a result of the COVID-related absences, we have had crews on, on vessels that are less familiar with particular routes uh, in order to ensure that there is the operation of the service. On the particular issue of familiarity and training with use of alternate ports, uh, ports, this, of course, is something that would be ideally done, and CalMAC would look to work towards this. But, of course, in doing that, you need to take vess vessels out of the service in order to do it. Uh, but I, but I, equally, I understand the impact this issue is having and the concerns of ferry users, and I will undertake personally to discuss this with senior management at CalMAC tomorrow. And supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. The Minister will be aware in terms of local government funding, the per head of um, population settlement received by Western Isles Council is significantly higher than that received by Orkney Islands Council. Yet ferry replacement costs on West Coast routes are covered by the Scottish Government, while OIC is left to pick up the significant tab uh, for replacing the ageing vessels on the internal services. Does the Minister believe that is fair? And if not, what is he going to do about it? Minister. President officer, this is a, a conversation that Mr MacArthur and I have had on numerous occasions, and I, and I note he did not acknowledge the substantial amount of funding that has already been provided to Orkney Islands Council, both in terms of the service delivery, and I think there was uh, capital funding provided for the replacement of a vessel previously, if memory serves. These vessels are the responsibility of the local authority, but I am aware that there is dialogue between the Cabinet Secretary of Finance 
and Orkney Islands Council and others on the very subject of, of what ferry replacement funding would look like going forward. And supplementary, Jenny Minto, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A combination of adverse weather and a rise in COVID cases amongst crew and shore staff have had a severe impact on service provision in recent weeks and days. What difference will the changes to the isolation rules make and what more can be done to encourage compliance by passengers with re relevant protective measures? Minister. President, officer, the um, Transport Scotland continues to engage daily with CalMac on the impacts to services and to monitor this as we move forward. The reduced isolation period uh, does already appear to be providing some relief to the pressures being faced, although, of course, there always remains the risk of disruption due to further infections of crew and staff. And let me place on record my appreciation of the work of the crew and staff throughout the pandemic, both on the, on, on the West Coast and in the Northern Isles. Um, as the restrictions are eased, the emphasis will continue to be on personal responsibility, good practice and informed judgment. And I would encourage everyone using our ferries to ask themselves if the journeys they are considering on ferry routes are necessary at this time in order that we best protect services and ensure space remains available, particularly for our island communities. Question number four, Paul Sweeney, who is joining us remotely. Sir, to ask the Scottish Government when it next plans to revise the conditions of eligibility for the Bus Service Operators Grant. Minister. So obviously the Bus Service Operators Grant is currently suspended and other than in exceptional circumstances. Emergency COVID-19 support grants are in place to support operators to maintain services. We are monitoring passenger numbers closely and developing options for future financial support for bus services, taking account of the continuing impact of the pandemic. Paul Sweeney. I thank the Minister for that response. And indeed, it is clear that the Bus Service Operators Grant was no longer fit for purpose. So, when looking to the future, can we look at alternative ways of doing this? So, such as looking at the provisions in the 2019 Transport Act powers for local authorities to regulate private providers to regional franchises and invest in publicly owned and accountable bus companies, because previously we have seen operators provided with financial support, but they continue to withdraw and extract and reduce bus services from communities across Glasgow and Scotland. Minister. Uh, so, officer, in terms of some of the concerns he's expressed uh, and I think his aspirations, I am not a million miles away from the views uh, of the member. Insofar as it is imperative moving forward that the bus provision that we have in this country is tailored to meet the needs and the requirements of our communities and bus users. That must be the priority. And I know Mr Sweeney has a real interest in this issue, and I would be more than happy to meet with him and discuss this matter further. Uh, and supplementary, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. What impact does the Minister think that the provision of free travel for all under 22s in Scotland might have on bus services, incomes for the bus companies, and their viability. Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, we're in a state of flux at the moment, there's no doubt about that. Um, in the context of the under 22 provision, we've set reimbursement terms carefully in line with the statutory objective of the free bus schemes that bus operators should be financially no better or no worse off as a result of their participation. In the short term, I would not therefore expect the scheme to have any negative effect. Uh, effect on services but over time by creating more demand for bus services and by supporting young people to adopt sustainable travel habits early in their lives, I would expect it to lead to increased bus usage, improving services and their viability. But given the impacts, the immediate impacts of the pandemic, it's going to take some time for all of that to work its way through. Question number five, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the priorities will be for the new Chief Scientific Advisor for Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture. Minister Marie McCallan, who is joining us remotely. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and I thank uh, Paul McLennan for the question. The new Chief Scientific Advisor for Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture, Professor Matthew Williams, uh, will lead the integration and effective use of evidence uh, and policy across a really wide range of subjects, including the environment, agriculture, um, climate change, biodiversity, food security, land use and indeed animal health um, and the overarching priorities for the role include delivering a strategic approach to science across the portfolio, um, providing assurance that scientific evidence and advice is robust and ensuring that ministers receive the most up-to-date uh, advice on key scientific issues. Paul McLennan. 
I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Professor Matthew Williams has 25 years of experience of monitoring and modelling terrestrial eco ecosystems and the resources, uh, responses to global change. Does she therefore share my view that Professor Williams is exactly the right person to ensure we continue to produce enough evidence to inform policy development and delivery at the heart of our journey towards net zero? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I absolutely do. Uh, sound scientific advice is utterly crucial to help us tackle Scotland's uh, environment and climate challenges. And as the member has set out, Professor Williams' expertise will be invaluable in helping us to address the challenges and indeed the opportunities that we face in the coming years in order to meet Scotland's world-leading net zero ambitions. Thank you. Uh, question number six, uh, Willie Coffey, who's joining us remotely. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling fuel poverty in Kilmarnock and Irwin Valley. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. We target all four drivers of fuel poverty, but decisions about low income benefits and regulation of the energy markets are reserved to the UK Government. Since 2013, we have allocated some £12.4 million through our area based schemes to improve energy efficiency in East Ayrshire. These projects have benefited more than 2,974 fuel poor households. Families in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley have also benefited from improvements delivered through our National Warmer Homes Scotland service. In addition, we continue to provide free and impartial advice to every household in Scotland through our energy Home Energy Scotland service. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, Scotland is an energy rich nation, yet nearly a quarter of all our households are still living in fuel poverty. Scottish Government initiatives are extremely important in helping us drive fuel poverty down. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that energy price hikes, raising the fuel price cap, and continuing to charge VAT will have a severe impact, particularly on the poorest in Scotland. And what can the Scottish Government do to press the UK Government to intervene in these matters before thousands more households in Scotland fall further into fuel poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Abdine Officer, uh, Mr Coffey makes a, a very good case about the increasing pressure that households are facing as a result of the financial pressures which are experiencing, including through the very significant increase we have seen in energy prices. Regulation and the pricing of the energy markets is reserved to the UK Government, and it is absolutely critical that the UK Government now take this matter seriously and take action in order to try and minimise the financial impact that significant energy prices could experience once the cap is reviewed in the next few weeks. The consequence of this, uh, if, the, if the UK government do not take action, is that potentially uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of households across the UK as a whole will be forced into fuel poverty. And that's why there are a range of measures which the UK government should look at taking, uh, not just including the issue of that, but also the various levies which are applied to energy uh, tariffs at the present moment, which can have a disproportionate impact on uh, households that are reliant upon in electrical heating. The UK government now need to act, and both myself and uh, Shona Robertson have made representations to the UK government on this matter, and we are seeking a meeting with them at uh, an early date in order to explore what further measures they are prepared to take in order to try and address what is a household financial crisis, which has been fuelled by the ever-increasing uh, costs of energy prices. A supplementary from Brian Whittle, who is joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Uh, tackling fuel poverty must include ensuring that homes are energy efficient. With that in mind, can I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary when the Scottish Government will set embodied carbon targets at early design stages for new builds and redevelopment projects and that these energy efficient measures are affordable for developers and accessible for all homes. Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, the member will be aware that, that the end of last year we published our uh, strategy for uh, buildings, uh, heating buildings, and to make sure that we were taking forward the right measures in order to reduce uh, fuel poverty, but also to improve insulation um, of properties which are being retrofitted. Alongside that, we are also looking at whether the existing building regulations need to be amended further uh, in order to ensure greater fuel efficiency uh, going forward. And all of that is part of our wider work in order to make sure that we meet our 2030 uh, 75 per cent uh, net zero target and our 2045 uh, net zero target as well. So these are all issues which we are continuing to look at in order to make sure that uh, residential premises in particular are increasingly fuel efficient and that we do so in a way that helps to reduce fuel poverty. Question number seven, Alistair Allen, who's joining us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what work is being undertaken to change electricity levy schemes in order to tackle fuel poverty in rural and island areas of the north of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the legal powers to regulate the energy markets and to set associated levies are reserved to the UK Government, and we have called on them to take action to protect energy consumers against the significant increases that are expected in retail prices in the coming <clears throat> months. We must see a review of the energy levies for social and environmental obligations as set out in our own uh, heat and building strategy, as we also set out in our fuel poverty strategy, uh, and also are a key ask that the Scottish Government has made of the UK Government through our own representations. I would certainly want to encourage anyone who is facing energy, high energy bills to contact Home Energy Scotland for advice on how they can reduce their fuel costs. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. The north of Scotland is a region rich in green energy and also has twice the Scottish levels of extreme fuel poverty. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has recognised, I think the uh, part of that problem is the unfair and archaic transmission charges set by the UK Government, which in effect charge consumers by how far they are from the south. Uh, in Scotland, there is a significantly higher distribution cost levy per unit for customers in the north of Scotland than in the south. So will the Scottish Government uh, continue now to lobby to get rid of that once and for all? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, officer, uh, Mr Allen makes a very good point, and he represents a constituency where there are greater levels of fuel poverty, which is exacerbated by some of the uh, environmental and social obligation costs, which are applied to energy bills which uh, end up causing a premium to be set uh, for some customers uh, making greater use particularly of electricity based uh, heating. That is why the Scottish Government will continue to make representations to the UK Government on this matter and the need to take urgent action to address uh, this issue uh, because uh, a failure to do so will simply cause more households to fall into fuel poverty. And that's why it is essential that the UK government take urgent action on this issue uh, before the review of the fuel price cap is completed and implemented in the months ahead. And supplementary, Liam Kerr. The Cabinet Secretary is very quick to blame the UK government, yet fails to mention that by removing subsidy for LPG heating systems through its Warmer Homes Scotland scheme, the Scottish Government is forcing electric-only heating solutions onto fuel-poor off-grid households when they may not be appropriate or what the consumer needs. So will the Cabinet Secretary consider reinstating support for heating technology such as LPG, which have a clear transition to renewable bio-LPG, in order to give fuel-poor households meaningful choice? Cabinet Secretary. The way to address this particular issue, uh, sign officer, is to deal with the unnecessary levies which have been applied to electricity costs, uh, which have been imposed by the UK government and through Ofgem, in order to reduce uh, the cost of electricity, um, rather than continuing to sustain uh, forms of energy technology which are not compatible with their net zero objectives. Uh, this requires a, a significant approach to changing the way in which energy is provided in this country and to simply try and tinker with this issue in the way in which I think Liam Kerr would suggest is the way in which to try and address it is not going to address fuel poverty significantly 
because the regulation of the present market is not working effectively and is not working in consumers' interests. And that's why the UK government need to get serious about this matter and start to take action before households find that their energy uh, costs by the course of the next coming few months uh, start to almost uh, increasing by 50 per cent if the uh, fuel price cap is lifted to the levels that it is expected to go. It's essential that the UK government step in and deal with this issue. Uh, if they do not do so, they will potentially send millions of households into fuel poverty as a result of their inaction and failure to regulate the energy markets properly. Question number eight, Sarah Burrett. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that public transport is accessible to disabled people. Minister. People with disabilities should be able to travel with the same freedom, choice, dignity and opportunity as other citizens. And that is why the 10-year accessible travel framework was created in 2016. It identifies 40 issues through discussions with disabled people and organisations that represent them. The Government continues to work closely with transport providers and disabled people's organisations to address those issues through a series of annual delivery plans. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The pandemic has exacerbated those challenges, particularly for people with sight loss in accessing public transport, for example, with short notice timetable changes and service cancellation. So what work is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that information is available to passengers, given that lots of transport apps appear to be developed separately? And as we come out of the pandemic, what support will be available to enable people with sight loss to access public transport services, such as access to support on trains and at stations? Minister. President, officer, a lot to unpack there. Uh, passenger assistance and provision uh, of information were two of the 40 issues identified within the 2016 framework. And I, I acknowledge that there is still work to be done there. Uh, if on public transport, despite our best efforts, we are coming up short in the way Sarah Boyack highlights, and I, I particularly note the point about during the pandemic, which is concerning, that would be a matter of concern to me. So I would be happy to meet the member, uh, to hear firsthand from her more about the concerns, both in, in the immediate term and the longer term, and see how we might better address these going forward. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.